Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos, um bom dia a todos, eu sou Denise Barbosa e estamos... bom dia, boa tarde, né, já passando de meio dia, estamos aqui ao vivo mais uma vez do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo, eu sou Denise Barbosa, McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como um espaço é, para conversas ao vivo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios e o tema de hoje é é sobre ecossistemas digitais no segmento de pequenas empresas. Today, we are hosting Miklos Diet, senior partner at McKinsey in Vancouver. Miklos has been uh, leading several, like over 50 ecosystem studies globally. Good morning, Miklos. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure. Marina Mansur, associate partner at McKinsey in Sao Paulo, currently leads McKinsey ecosystem work in the region. Good afternoon. Boa tarde, Marina. Boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon, Denise. And Eduardo Arnoni, senior advisor at McKinsey in Sao Paulo, specialized in payments. Good afternoon, Eduardo. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Vale lembrar que vocês de casa poderão fazer perguntas durante toda a sessão, utilizando o campo que fica à direita da tela, se você estiver usando um PC, ou embaixo do celular. Por favor, contribuam. A participação de vocês é fundamental. Today's session will be in English. Marina, let's get started. Thank you, Denise. So, ecosystem is a buzzword that we have been hearing from our clients for the past years a phenomenon that started in China, that is taking its first steps in Brazil, and it's now the focus of the agenda of several CEOs. But what are ecosystems and what is the value of them? Ecosystems are interconnected uh, sets of services and products all offered in one single platform. That means that for the client that usually had to do monoliner relationship with companies buying products and services in different, in different channels can now do several parts of their journeys into one single platform. Miklos, you have led several ecosystem studies around the, around the globe. What is the value of an ecosystem? Well, the value of an ecosystem comes from reinventing how it serves the needs of both supply and demand customers and providers. From a customer perspective, uh, a digital end-to-end -end ecosystem gives incredible comfort. I don't have to go to different providers to serve my needs to get a home. I don't have to get separately mortgage, separately a real estate agent, separately somebody to repair my home. I can get everything in one orchestrated journey, comfortable, and uh, very, uh, very transparent. From a provider perspective, uh, ecosystems create ability to access at very large efficiency, at very low cost of acquisition to a really large number of customers. But of course, it's especially valuable for the companies who are orchestrating it because it enables them, enable them to own customers across multiple journeys, become the gateway to them and create tremendous value by orchestrating it. Ultimately, it is the merger of many value chains into one integrated, extremely efficient uh, value chains. As a transformation is the largest economic transformation in the history of the planet. We are calculating that by 2030, over $60 trillion dollars will be intermediated by these ecosystems instead of traditional industry value chains. They, these ecosystems typically form not along industries and supply chains, but around customer needs. I gave you an example on housing. People don't need mortgages. The mortgage value chain only exists because traditionally we have mortgage industry, the same way home insurance. People, what people really need is a home. All of these are just tools. And the moment it is possible to get them, not vertically, but across the whole journey, we are expecting a large number of people, not all obviously, uh, moving into this. This transformation, this uh, 60 trillion transformation uh, is, will create, instead of 88 industries we have seen in the previous page, only around 12 very large ecosystems, enormous playgrounds in which companies will be competing on who become the ecosystem orchestrator. And the winners will have the customer, the winners will have the data, winner, the winners will have this magic positive spiral of traffic, data, and then emotional connection or love. And 
other companies may become more like white label back offices behind them. The global capital markets are betting on ecosystems winning already at a very large extent. It's really not just an economic theory or some expectations about 2030, it is today. If you are looking at the largest global companies in terms of market cap, with the exception of Saudi Aramco, all major trillion dollars players, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, what is common about them, Tencent, Alibaba, is that they are not in one industry. They are doing multiple things. They are creating customer journeys across multiple services. What is Apple exactly? Is it a consumer electronic firm, but also have apps? What is exactly Amazon? Uh, the, the power of these gigantic hyperscale platforms is that they can own customers, they can provide them more and more services, and they can create a disproportionate amount of economic value. But the capital markets are not just rewarding tech companies who are going after these ecosystems. If you look at in most industries, you will find that by now the highest valued companies are uh, players who were able to get out of the traditional value chain thinking of the industry. Disney is the number one entertainment company in the world, but it's a great example of an ecosystem from uh, TVs and movies to entertainment parks and cruises, although I'm not sure cruises are the most exciting this year. The number one insurance company in the world is not one of those gigantic European players, but Pingang from China, who grew spectacularly by reinventing itself, building ecosystems around healthcare, around uh, house homes, around mobility, effectively having over 500 million ecosystem users to whom they can offer insurance in a way no other company can. The number one bank in the world, the largest bank is ICBC, and the largest financial institution now is Visa, is actually their ecosystem players. Lego is the number one toy maker, but it's also doing movies and softwares. Traditional retailers, telco companies, they are all transforming into this model. Interestingly, even the largest car maker in the world in terms of value, Tesla, is actually not just a car maker. They, they, with their own charging stations, with their own solar panels, with their own software platforms, they are ecosystem players. So clearly, it is not just a major economic transformation with tremendous value, but also already getting tremendous investor support and recognition for value creation. Thank you, Miklos. And Eduardo, Miklos mentioned several companies across all industries, and you have been leading a lot of the McKinsey studies around payments and financial institutions. So why do you think that ecosystems, why, why does ecosystems matter for banks? Yeah. I would say you can look in banks from two angles. One angle that uh, Miklos has just uh, talked about, about opportunities, and so there are several opportunities that the banks can think about. But you can also look through the angles of uh, threats if they end up doing nothing. And there are at least four uh, big threats for the banks uh, uh, that they are facing through this transformation towards ecosystems. They might uh, be disintegrated in disaggregate in a way that uh, now customers, uh, it is much easier for them to select different products from different players. You can have your investment in XP, you can have uh, your acquiring Estonia, you can have uh, uh, Safra doing other stuff, and so you can select players much easier than it was in the past. You can even have players that are not banks serving you, and sometimes you don't even notice that there is a, a banking or a payments uh, initiative on the background. So imagine mm -hmm. when you take uh, your Uber, uh, or I've noticed you just asked some uh, food in here. In reality, there is a payments, there is a acquiring transaction, there is a banking solution in the background that uh, you don't even notice. You just uh, leave the car uh, when you are your own destiny, and that's it. Perfect. And uh, Miklos, we, McKinsey, have been working with those clients. Denise mentioned that you've done over 50 projects on this subject, and we have been working with those clients for the past, I don't know, five years or so. What have you learned from the first movers? Well, what we have learned is, number one, it is increasingly critical, if we, if we go to the next page, if it's increasingly critical 
that almost every company have a strategy for ecosystems. You don't have to want to be the next Amazon. You don't have to want to be a gigantic tech company, but you need to have an answer. If there is a word when your competition will not just come from inside your in industry, but from outside your industry, when you are facing this intermediation for companies who have vastly different economics than you, and they may have enormous scale advantage. I mean, some of these players like Tencent and Alibaba have over a billion customers already. If you do not have an answer to this, if you do not have a plan, you are in trouble. What we have also learned is trying to own and build and effectively run an ecosystem is not actually easy, at least, Half of the companies who have tried didn't really succeed too much on building this up. And, uh, and while there are many who had certain amount of success, only for around 10%, we would say that they have truly able to create distinctive and differentiated value for their shareholders. Interestingly, they, came, they come from all sectors, including telecom players and industrial players. So the good news is that in any industry, you can reinvent yourself, go into other industries and leverage this digital revolution to create value. But it is really not easy. However, there are two positive news. Number one, it's not actually very expensive. These are not major capital investments. It is much more about strategy, business focus, making the right choice. It, it is a businessman, it's worth trying, worth experimenting, worth taking some risk and also accepting that some will not succeed. And there return on investment can be very substantial. And the other thing what we have learned is the, cha is the, is, uh, the challenge, the biggest reason, the number one reason of companies not realizing opportunities in such a major transformation is not because they don't have ideas. Almost any company can have ideas. It's not because they are too big or too small. Almost any size of companies can succeed. It's many frequently connected to governance. It is very tricky for a company to try to reinvent its business model. It's a way to serve customers while doing also the traditional business. It's very hard to find the right balance of new talent versus old talent and give this kind of entrepreneurial culture, maintain an entrepreneurial culture next to a traditional business model. Perfect. Just switching gears a little bit. So we talk a lot about what an ecosystem is and what's the value on them. But today we're talking about ecosystems for SMEs. The SME market has been for several years neglected by big banks who traditionally served big companies. And mainly because it was a market that was really hard to get data on. It was a market with a huge cost of acquisition because they are highly fragmented and distributed. So, but suddenly, all of a sudden, they became the epicenter of the attention of several players. Banks are trying to figure out how to tackle the SME and how to serve those SMEs in a profitable way. In a profitable way. Uh, also, we see payment companies looking out for them and trying to expand those offers into more than payments into a broader financial and, and beyond financial uh, ecosystem. And we also see retailers that figure out that it was not only uh, it was it was not only profitable putting the seller into the marketplace, but it had to serve the seller into a much broader way in a, in a much B two B broader ecosystem. So, Eduardo. In payments and in financial institutions, you have been working with the SME and the B2B market a lot. So what do you think made this shift happen of SME becoming the focus of the attention all of a sudden? I think there were probably three main reasons that impacted that shift. So I would say the first came from the customer demand. So more and more, the SME clients I uh, started to expect the, the banks or the payment uh, providers, uh, uh, their, uh, their providers to really uh, give the same level of service that they have as an individual. So nowadays as an individual, if you go to your banking app, it's uh, much easier. Uh, you can do transfers, you can see your balance, you can do everything, while this experience wasn't uh, present on uh, the SME side. And so there were, this demand from customers uh, for that level of service in real time and so on. The second uh, uh, change was uh, changes in terms of the industry. 
and uh, probably the change in the industry has to do with the economics and so with the decrease of the interest rates uh, the margins become more and more uh, challenging but also uh, the regulation uh, kind of uh, provided the environment for uh, newcomers for open banking and for many changes on how to make much easier for someone to, to enter on that arena. Uh, and also, uh, the whole advancement of technology allowed uh, newcomers to really come up with uh, much cheaper uh, business models. And so you don't uh, need to have uh, four, five, seven thousand uh, branches across the country. You can have uh, one solution that is digital and then can enable and serve all these clients uh, much simpler and much cheaper. And so the combination of the customer demand, uh, the industry changes, and, um, uh, and uh, the, the new models what was what allowed uh, the players to really uh, be successful on that market. And then what we've seen is a really proliferation of uh, players uh, all over the world. And uh, this is just, uh, I think, 30 or 40 uh, logos of companies that position on this one, but we could uh, populate with probably another 200, uh, 2,000 players that were serving uh, those markets. And even in Brazil, I think there is one logo in there, but uh, we could talk about uh, Magalu, we could talk, could talk about uh, Rappi and many others that are not only in financial institutions, but also in other sectors uh, starting to, to tap uh, into this market. And so wh what we've seen is that uh, nowadays, uh, the banks, when they think about the SME segment, it's not that uh, the competitor for Itaú is Bradesco, Banco do Brasil, and Santander. More and more, we see uh, different players with different economics and uh, different uh, business logic trying to serve this market. So now you might uh, uh, see a payments company uh, competing with a software company uh, and an accounting company trying to serve uh, this market as well. Uh, the retailers and the telcos. And uh, uh, the one who really manages to, to add more value to those clients are the ones uh, who will succeed and be able to, to be the orchestrator of those ecosystems. Perfect. And Miklos, uh, a lot of people talk about Alibaba as one of the biggest marketplaces and ecosystems in the world. And they have a huge B2B ecosystem behind it to make it possible for the sellers to sell on those platforms. From our experience, uh, thinking about cases such as Alibaba and Tencent and all the other different players that we see on the screen, what is the value proposition behind a B2B ecosystem, an SME ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Well, if we go to the next page, ultimately the value proposition of uh, a B2B ecosystem is to solve the two big problem of any small uh, businesses. Number one, give me more customers, give me access to more uh, ways to reach my target. And number two, please take care of everything else. My bureaucracy, my accounting, my operations, my supply chain. These are two pain points which we see equally whether we are look, doing research in Russia or Canada or Brazil or Europe. It is the ultimate challenge for small businesses. And if you look at how they are currently served, they get an extremely fragmented landscape of different online and offline services to try to solve these. Whoever solves this problem and can create an integrated solution which uh, can own a gateway to these small businesses, and, and as it was said before, becomes the owner of the customer and as a gateway becomes the platform, can orchestrate services. Just to give you some feeling, by the way, we are estimating this to be over $9 trillion globally as a business opportunity, just the digital part of these emerging ecosystems. How to solve these problems? Give me more customers is typically solved by, can you digital, give me access to marketplaces? Can you digitalize my CRM, my campaign management? While the solving my uh, bureaucratic problem is typically automating uh, accounting, automating uh, tax administrative services, automating supply chain. It's all about connecting already existing dots, but in a way that it's so convenient and easy that, that decision makers, and the plural here is by design, decision makers in SME can just 
go to a portal and do uh, many of these things. In both of these ecosystems, there is an incredible land grab race running because there is no natural owner uh, to this ecosystem. They may be tech platforms, they may be banks, they may be payment companies, they may be accounting companies, but the truth is that in this game, whoever will be able to create a value proposition which is convenient and end-to-end first mm-hmm. will become the orchestrator. Okay, and uh, Miklos, what's the usually starting point? Well, there are usually two uh, starting points. For the first one, for what we call the give me more customers or the customers, the starting point is, well, we can, uh, is, 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 is typically try to build and create a marketplace and own the so-called SKU level payment data. Right? And the second one, the starting point is frequently accounting data and so on. But in terms of strategies, the question of where do you start if you are an incumbent company, any incumbent company who have SMB services, you have more or less three options. Either you say that you go after one uh, horizontal, you, you, you go after the one magic solution and identify critical part of multiple SMB topics. For example, hey, I want to digitalize your accounting services and accounting is a service which has tentacles in almost everything else. So I am building an ecosystem on a very strong skeleton. You know, or you can do what we call option B. You build a lot of different smaller services and you connect them without the strong skeletal structure. Or C, you can choose to you can choose to have a vertical approach. Instead of trying to have solutions to all SMBs across all industry, you can just this, this say, hey, I'm specializing on one specific ecos- uh, vertical, for example, agriculture, healthcare, and I'm creating a value proposition which is so targeted and customized for that uh, sector that I can do differentiated, truly uh, differentiated value proposition. What is common in all of these cases is that the concept is that you get a hook, a service to the SMEs, but instead of just providing that to them, you use this as an intro to become the whole platform. And you are constantly adding new services, in also in a very smart and segmented way, recognizing that small businesses don't move like retail customers. It takes more time to get them. It, uh, it is usually a more of a step-by-step process. And Eduardo, uh, we are also always trying to take the shift into financial institutions and payments behind it. So what's in it for banks on serving that market and serving as an ecosystem? I think the the first thing for banks is to protect uh, their franchise uh, into into the SME uh, sector. And so there is the risk of uh, doing nothing might lead you to lose uh, most of your clients. Uh, to different players, either retailers or uh, the acquirers that are trying to to advance uh, into uh, into credit and uh, into other areas of financial services. But then beyond that, you can think about, uh, well, this can bring me more revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, And so by serving better my clients, I can either gain share of wallet and uh, be able uh, to capture more of the relationship with the clients. I can access uh, revenue pools that I wasn't uh, ex- accessing before. So I can now uh, be able to, to sell a software uh, to my banking client. And uh, this is an additional revenue that can uh, generate uh, an important contribution to, to the p and But uh, the, the most important one so far uh, has been around valuation. And so it's not that the EBIT contributions of the ecosystem have been significant for the bank so far. But uh, we've seen, uh, I think, as Miklos uh, showed before, the companies that uh, position themselves and as ecosystem managed to get uh, uh, significant benefits in terms of the valuation, much more than the benefits that uh, is already present uh, uh, in the PL through the EBITs. They started to be seen by the market not as a financial institution, but as a tech company, right? Or not as a retailer, but as a tech company. And the multiples on the valuation of tech companies are much higher. And and being perceived as someone with a significant growth potential that uh, might dominate the market in the future. 
Perfect. And, and thinking about just switching gears uh, a little bit, and, and that goes for you, Miklos, uh, thinking about, this is a stretch for the company, right? I have my core business, I know how to do the, that core business really well, and all of a sudden I have to expand to different products and services that are completely out of reach in terms of what my know-how, uh, or my original know-how was. So how do you see, Miklos, the adaptations in terms of culture and in terms of capability building of those companies that are becoming ecosystems? I mean, it is, it is such a good question and it's certainly a stretch. This is why we find that this is the number one challenge and the number one reason why so many companies doesn't succeed, even though the idea in itself is actually quite logical and it can actually get reasonably quick payback. The big challenge uh, is to get right the healthy balance between uh, maintaining parallel cultures within the organization. You need to run the core business in a robust sensible way, by at the same time maintain an entrepreneurial culture of developing these new services a little bit separately. It cannot be too far from the organization because then you cannot connect the dots, but also cannot be too close because then the two cultures will not uh, work together. It requires hiring different type of people, sorting out a different model of incentivization, creating typically less matrix driven, more entrepreneurial governance model from venture capital like stage gating of financing to different ways of hiring people and rolling out businesses. While it is not trivial and indeed a balancing act, it's very rewarding, not just because it creates tremendous value. We have just throwing around the trillions of dollars, but it's truly the largest economic opportunity in front of most companies in the world right now. But it is also helpful because it's uh, enables bringing a new type of talent, maintaining and exciting them. Uh, for financial uh, businesses, banks specifically, it enables to move from not just financial needs, but really think about end-to-end -end in the customer. Ultimately, it is a way to bring in talent and thinking which can rejuvenate businesses which are otherwise being commoditized, as Eduardo said, right? If you really think about the future of mortgage or bank accounts, they are so uniform that the only way to really make them successful in the long term is to create longer values. It enables people to become more clients, banks to become more uh, segment and client uh, focused. It enables them to solve the problem of leveraging and really monetizing data. It is enabling them to connect with a large number of partners, continuously bringing in new ideas, expanding uh, the business model, decreasing the cost of acquisition. It enables essentially to reinvent the whole business model without taking the enormous risks of trying to reinvent it from within. So it is not easy. It is really actually hard, but it uh, but it's worth doing. If we go to the next page, I would say uh, that there are a couple of mission critical elements or mistakes to avoid, but also getting things right. The first, as I mentioned, is to find the right home or this portfolio of initiatives. Not every ecosystem initiative is equal. Some of them fit naturally to business as usual. Some of them are crazy moonshots, which needs to be managed as venture capital ideas, but there is a lot of them in between, which requires a smart in, uh, incubator, accelerator type of uh, balancing act, which I just mentioned. The second thing is bringing in the right people. You can have very talented people running the business. This type of business requires different one people who have the entrepreneurial ability, so-called triathletes who can have business ownership, people leadership, and technology understanding uh, together. The third thing is uh, having really high efficiency partnership and collaboration with other companies. In my experience, most companies, most banks are not are good in that thing co-branded credit cards, a couple of type of partnership, but not necessarily at the scale of constantly in conversation, being in conversation with 50 companies, constantly rolling out new value propositions with different partners. That requires a kind of speed and portfolio management skill that others don't have. And finally, it is also very important to recognize, to, to have the right KPIs and the right financial targets. 
ecosystem is a tremendous value opportunity, but it needs to be measured properly. As Eduardo also mentioned, it may not immediately bring you the profits. It may, at the beginning, may give you customers and give you uh, value creation at your core business. It can also very quickly help your valuation multiple, but it may only create substantial revenues later and profitability even later. And it is important to have the right financial targets and measure them in a way that is disciplined, but you don't expect these new digital cross-industrial businesses have exactly the same economic model than your traditional ones. Perfect. And I, I love what you said specifically about point three, because uh, what we've seen in a lot of our clients is that they are such, they're used to such a culture of being the owners of the product and, 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 and making margins on top of their own products that they are not that used to collaborate and orchestrate third parties' products, right? I think this is a shift that it's huge culturally and strategically for, for companies. Before we go to questions from the audience, I would like to, and I would like to ask you both uh, the same question. And Eduardo, for you in Brazil and Miklos, for you globally. Are ecosystem a fad or are they here to stay? Is this a transformation that there's no way back? And how do you see the development of ecosystems globally and then in, in Brazil? I'll start with you, Miklos. Well, I, I mean, as, as argued earlier, I don't think this is a fad. It is so, from a customer perspective, it is so much more convenient to, follow, to, to forget all the traditional industry barriers, which only exist because of historical offline supply chains and get all I want in a comfortable way at one touch point. Customers don't want these industries. They want their needs to be served. So I, 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 I think that needs, and if you have such a powerful customer need, eventually economy will always adapt. And we see already the evidences all over the world. Companies are Every, every week, every month, we have uh, great examples of companies running their new ecosystem value propositions, IPO in your business, just showing how they can create value. We are seeing how, how uh, they are making a different, how they are getting competitive advantage. We are seeing how the capital markets are giving them trillions. If nothing else, you know, valuations become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we are seeing, uh, we are seeing how regulators and everyone else uh, build up behind them. Now, we don't see yet how many will truly succeed. And my gut feeling is that while this is a major transformation, there is, no, there is a room for only a few true winners. There will probably be more failures than successes in this one, but the upside is so disproportionately larger than the downside that this is a trend which I think is here to say. And uh, for those who are moving quickly, they can get a historical opportunity to reinvent themselves. Yeah, I agree with Miklos. I think it is uh, here to stay. And uh, the reason that I believe it is uh, here to stay is just because the clients are asking for that. And so when you decided to open a restaurant, usually it's because you like to cook or you like to serve people. It's not because you like to do banking and uh, the bureaucracy and the administrative tasks. And so if you have someone that can easily serve on all of that and that you can spend more time uh, cooking and serving your clients, that's what you want. And uh, if the clients want, in the end, uh, there will be someone to serve them on that needs. Perfect. Thank you so much, you two. With that, Denise, I'll give to you to see if we have any questions from the audience, please. We do have a few questions here. The first one is for Miklos. What, do you do say, what would you say is the core of an ecosystem? What makes the different members of the ecosystem dance to the same tune? Well, uh, I would argue that at the core of an ecosystem is this magic triangle of data traffic and love. Uh, if you get into this positive spiral of getting a lot of customer traffic, which then gives you a lot of data, which enables you to personalize services better and therefore have more emotional connection with the customers, then you get even more traffic, even more data. If you get this type of positive spiral, right, uh, 
that creates so much value. It creates such incredible customer attraction that every participant is winning. That uh, that is at the heart of it. Miklos, if I may add, I also put payments on the backbone of it also, right? To have yeah, an integrated true. payment uh, platform. And we're seeing this. In that, is, that is absolutely true. The, the one interesting thing, if you look at what is the one common theme between all the ecosystem players, whether they are the Alibabas, whether they are the Amazons, whether they are the Apples, they all have different business model. They all are going after payments. And the reason why going after payments is because payments is critical for this data traffic love circle because payments create the most economic touch points and the most important personal data. So if you really want to have data and if you really want to have this magic uh, traffic, then you need to own the payment piece. This is why the competition and the land grab race for payment is so intense. It's not necessary. This is a business which is likely to become zero profit because you can create so much value exactly. from monetizing it in other ways. Another question here. The next one is for Eduardo. Who are the different players that are taking advantage of this ecosystem opportunity in Brazil? Yeah, I think so. Linking to, to, to Miklo's answer before and to Marina's comment about payments, I think uh, the ones who own the payment are uh, in a great position to expand and to build some ecosystem. So we see, for example, Stone make acquisition with uh, uh, links and uh, developing new services to try to position themselves as ecosystems. Uh, you see uh, from other angles, uh, Happy and Magalu. Uh, coming up and trying to expand uh, into that. Uh, you see Mercado uh, Livre with Mercado Pago and uh, uh, all the, the solutions that they have to SMB also uh, with a significant position. And also you see uh, the large banks uh, really trying to, to expand and to reposition and to recreate their offering to SMB to, uh, to really uh, try to tackle this market. So I would say at this moment that uh, there is no clear winner. I think there are many contenders trying to, to really uh, gain the, the battle towards uh, being the, the main ecosystem provider. Eduardo, we have another question here for you. Uh, it came in Portuguese. So excuse me, Miklos, I'm going to just say this one in Portuguese in just a little bit. Uh, faz, uh, Eduardo, Eduardo, vemos fintechs como Nubank e C6 expandindo a atuação para o mercado de seguros, junto com seguradoras tradicionais. Onde as insurtechs se encaixam nesse novo contexto? Eu acho que também vou responder, vou responder em português, também, dado que veio em português. Eu acho que assim, tanto na, na questão do, do ecossistema, né, eu acho que diferentes players vão ter que fazer a reflexão se eles vão ser o orquestrador do ecossistema ou se eles vão ser mais um provedor dentro do ecossistema. Eu acho que dentro das insurtechs, né, você vai ter desde aquelas que vão tentar estabelecer como uh, o orquestrador principal do ecossistema e vão ter que expandir e colocar outros serviços além de seguros, mas você vai ver algumas que vão tentar muito mais reconhecer que são plataformas e que são parceiros de alguns orquestradores e que podem é, conectar esses orquestradores e é, conseguir servir o, a, os SMEs, as PJs é, desse modelo. É importante reconhecer, né, se você quer ser um orquestrador ou se você quer ser um parceiro, as capacitações que você tem que desenvolver são bastante distintas. Então, entender qual que é o seu posicionamento, qual que é a oportunidade que você está perseguindo, é crítico para saber o que, que você vai uh, priorizar. Né? And on that tone, I'll switch to English because then Miklos can, can comment as well. One of the biggest ecosystem in the world is Pinga, which was an insurance company, a financial, but mostly insurance company before. We also have a huge ecosystem uh, that is Vitality Discovery that found out a niche to play, which is building an ecosystem of health and wealth beyond insurance. So there are a lot of opportunities for insurance companies to orchestrate an ecosystem that is niche on the health and wellness market, but I completely agree with you. They can also be connected to bigger ecosystems. Uh, no, I, I would I would just add that insurance is one of those industries where the need is also the biggest, right? I mean, yeah. if you think about it, insurance is 
not a business in itself, but it's an important step in many other businesses. I mentioned home insurance, part of the home business, health insurances. It's always an enabler, which on the positive side, give insurance unparalleled opportunity to understand deeply what customers need. Therefore, they can orchestrate. On the other hand, insurance are facing the biggest risk of being commoditized. So there is a reason why insurance companies are much faster than others. And many of the best examples of uh, ecosystem builders from Australia to Europe to obviously China with being done are insurance companies. They have to. We have one more question here it's for you, Miklos. Could you please talk more about services marketplaces compares to products? Yes, of course. I think product market, we, the word started with product marketplaces because it's easier to economize. It's more of just, you know, marketplace. It starts with e-commerce and expands into some marketplaces like Amazon. But the, if you look at global economy services, actual services is a much bigger business. They solve bigger problems. The difference between the, core of the service marketplaces like small business service marketplaces is a digital platform, a gateway, a, a, a platform where you can connect different uh, solutions and you can buy service providers who can digitally or physically provide you those services. It, you don't need logistics, traditional logistics for this, but you need much more integration than traditional products. If you want to get, for example, good tax services, it's ideal if it connects to your accounting system. If you want to get banking services, ideally, again, accounting and other data will help you to provide these services. Legal services, uh, supply chain, delivery, almost everything uh, you are needing in service needs to have this type of integration at a platform level. While it sounds complicated and service business typically tends to be fragmented, uh, it is the same patterns we have seen on, let's say, digital content first, like the Netflixes and stuff, and later on products like e-commerce is happening in services, maybe a little bit slower, but it is in the end game is actually much bigger because we are speaking about much larger part of the economy shifting. Water than China, what companies have leveraging ecosystems successfully and what makes them successful? Wow, there are quite a lot. Uh, and yes, indeed, China is a bit unique because it moved earlier. But let me give you some examples. Uh, for example, in Canada, we see a Canadian telecom player, Telus, moving earlier than the others. And just a few weeks ago, they have IP or the business, a business process business, which enabled them to move their market valuation higher than any other uh, North American telco in terms of multiples, not in terms of total dollars. We have seen banks from uh, Europe becoming very successful. Sphere of Russia is a great example of a bank which reinvented itself into an ecosystem orchestrator, and they are truly in digital businesses in very different part of the Russian economy. And Russia is a Great example, by the way. So also Brazil, these markets are, have some similar characteristics. From Australia to Netherlands, we are seeing very successful ecosystem players emerging uh, all over the world. What was the other half of the question? Or what is the secret what? of their success? I think, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a combination of two things. First, first mover advantage. The thing about ecosystems, it's a big jump. Whoever gets a meaningful uh, customer uh, experience improvement first, they basically lock in customers. Ecosystems are so incredibly comfortable that once small businesses or retail customers start to use them, it's very hard to get them to something else. And the other uh, secret is though, these players have realized that to get people moving to these ecosystems, it's not enough to give them a 5% or a 6% improvement of experience. It needs to be a bigger one. It needs to be a quantum leap of experience. So they basically say, whoever moves first with a big enough jump and then locks people in, they almost go into a self-fulfilling prophecy because once you have the platform, everybody wants to partner with you. Therefore, you have better services. Therefore, you will have more capital. Therefore, you can hire the best people in the world. So it's really about the speed, finding the first really meaningful big jump you can do. As the joke says, you don't have to run faster than the lion. You just have to run faster than the other hunters. <laughs> uh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miklos, Marina, and Eduardo. 
por this conversation today. Muito obrigada pra, por essa conversa de hoje. E aos participantes que enviaram suas perguntas também, muito obrigada. E a todos vocês que ficaram com a gente os últimos 45 minutos. Próxima sessão, dia 5 de março, às 8 e 30 da manhã. Vamos voltar ao nosso horário tradicional. E o nome da sessão é Transformação de Dentro para Fora, da digitalização do core à reinvenção. A entrevista vai ser com o Gustavo Fonseca, esse emo da Sky e atual VP da DirecTV, Latam. Participação de André Nascimento, sócio da McKinsey em São Paulo, e também do Gabriel Codo, associate partner da McKinsey em São Paulo. Para você conhecer a nossa grade completa, a nossa agenda completa aqui do McKinsey Talks, acesse mckinseytalks.com. Lá vocês podem assistir aos episódios anteriores e na segunda-feira esse episódio de hoje vai estar também lá. E para quem curte podcast, os áudios desses nossos encontros também estão disponíveis, estão lá no Spotify. Muito obrigada, até a próxima, bom fim de semana. Até a Tchau. próxima. Obrigado.